Let's ask God to bless our time and our study. Father, I just thank you for the privilege of teaching your word. What an honor it is to look at the uh, prophecies of Zechariah and see how they were being fulfilled over the years of time and how we could even talk about events right up to this very hour and see what's going on in the world today and compare to what your prophets had to say. So bless me now as I teach, and I pray, God, for strength, for clarity of voice, and I pray also, Lord, that what I have to say is very understandable and exciting to all of us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. The lesson is entitled, Whoever Curses Israel, God Curses, and we're looking at Zechariah chapter 1, and we're going to finish chapter 1, verses 18 through 21. You might remember that God made two covenants with Abraham, and Abraham was the father of the Jewish people. And the first covenant I want to talk about is what's known as the generational covenant, and that is found in Genesis chapter 12, and you're all familiar with that one, where God told Abraham, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in all the families of the earth, in you, they shall be blessed. Well, I want you to see there are five parts to this generational covenant. Number one, from out of the loins of Abraham will come a great nation called Israel. Number two, Abraham will become an honorable household name. Number three, he will be greatly blessed by God as his name means father of a multitude and was called God's friend forever. You see that in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 7. Isn't it wonderful to be called a friend of God? And yet that's exactly a title that was given to Abraham. Number four, those nations that bless Israel, God will bless. What? Oh, I'm sorry, no problem. Second Chronicles, you'll get your notes, it's in the notes. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 7. Anyway, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Number four, those nations that bless Israel, God will bless. And those who curse Israel, God will curse. And number five, from out of the loins of Abraham, all the nations will be blessed in that through his bloodline, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, is going to come into the world. We're calling that the generational covenant. Now, there's also a land covenant that God made with Abraham, and we're going to talk more about that next week. But just to let you in on what the land covenant is, it's found over in Genesis chapter 17, verses 7 and 8. And there we find Abraham uh, coming to the promised land, the land of Canaan. And remember, God said, I want you to look to the north, I want you to look to the south, the east, the west. As far as you can see, all of this land belongs to you and your descendants. Now get this word, forever. That's why the nation of Israel is in the land today, and that is the very reason why they will never be driven out of their land. The book of Amos chapter 9, at the very end of that prophet's uh, words, says that once Israel is back in her land again, she will never be uprooted. God honors his covenant to his people. So that's the land covenant. We're not dealing with that today. We'll deal with that later. What I want us to look at is that part of the generational covenant where God says to Abraham, I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you shall be a blessing, but here's the key. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. So, anybody who honors the nation of Israel, blesses Israel, prays for the peace of Jerusalem, God says, I'm going to bless you, I'm going to bless that nation. But when we turn against the nation of Israel, God says, I'm going to curse that nation. That's why this election is so, so important. Because we need to elect people that are going to stand behind the nation of Israel, not behind the Palestinians. And I'll tell you why. A little later, you just have to hang in there. Now let's just set a background for 
in the book of Zechariah. You want to get over to Zechariah chapter 1. I've talked about this each of the weeks, but I think it's important to understand why he's writing. We're going back to the year 520 B.C. The Jews have been in the land now for 18 years. They have returned from Babylonian captivity. They were given a responsibility of building the temple, the temple that had been destroyed during the time of King Nebuchadnezzar. Remember that? It was nothing but rubble. The city of Jerusalem was nothing but rubble. Well, in the first year, they got the brazen altar built. The second year, they got the foundation of the temple laid. Everything seemed to be going fine, except there was opposition from the people in the land. The Samaritans, the Jews, I mean the uh, Gentiles, were doing everything they could to halt the work. And finally, they did for 16 years. Nothing was done. They were paneling their own houses. They cared nothing about building the temple of God. And so finally, God raises up two prophets. He raises up Haggai. He raises up Zechariah. And they are to motivate the people to get the work and get the temple built. And so the angel of the Lord, we identified him in chapter 1, who is Jesus Christ. It's a Christophany. It's an appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ appears to Zechariah with good and comforting words. And then... He gives to Zechariah eight visions, one right after another. Last week, we looked at the first vision, the vision of the four horsemen among the myrtle trees. I'm not going to go into that. That was last week. I don't have time to review it. Tonight, we're going to look at the second vision that God gives to Zechariah. Let's look now at verses 18 and 19 of Zechariah chapter 1, and it's seen in the strength of four horns. Verse 18, And then I raised my eyes and looked, and there were four horns. And I said to the angel who talked with me, What are these? So he answered me, These are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. I want you to note, first of all, the significance of the horns. Now, the word horn here refers to an animal horn, which was used for a couple of reasons back in those days. First of all, it was a warning to announce an event. Like, for example, uh, Rosh Hashanah always began with the blowing of the horns. It was going to announce a great event. But also... It was to announce danger, that perhaps an enemy is coming, and we've got to be prepared for war. But in a symbolic way, the word horn refers to the power of a nation. And the psalmist, for example, talks about lifting up the horn, which simply means to increase power. You get over to the book of Daniel, chapter 7. The Antichrist is referred to as a horn, a little horn. And we're going to talk about that later on in this lesson. And the kingdom of the Antichrist is identified by ten horns who are ten kings. Now when you get your notes for today, we're on page two. And notice uh, which talks about the strength of four horns there in your outline. Then we've just looked at point one, the significance of the horns. Notice next, the scattering of Israel by four horns. In Zechariah's vision, he sees four horns, which are four Gentile kings who scattered the enslaved people of Israel. Now let's get back here to verse 19 of Zechariah chapter 1. Notice it says this, These are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. The word scattered is the word I want us to look at. In the Hebrew, it is in what is called perfect tense, which refers to a completed action in the past, a completed action in the present, and a completed action in the future. It has no time factor to it at all. That's very significant, and you'll see why a little later on in this lesson. The text, therefore, could read like this. 
These are the horns. Remember, these horns are nations which have scattered and enslaved the Jewish people. These are the horns which have scattered, which are scattering, present, and which will scatter Judah. We're talking about something future when we use the perfect tense with that word scattered. Notice now the statue in King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Everybody up with me now on the notes. You can follow along a lot easier. Okay. We want to identify who these four horns are. And I think the best place to go is to the second chapter of the book of Daniel. And remember, and you've had this story told to you many times, I know you took a class on the book of Daniel, so I'm not telling you anything fresh here, but let's uh, review it. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and uh, this dream is reoccurring, and he's bothered greatly by this dream. And uh, he wants to know, what is this dream that I'm having, and what is the meaning of this dream? And so he calls his astrologers, his wise men, his magicians, his seers. And uh, he, he says to them, I want to know what my dream is, and I want you to give an interpretation of that dream. And they said, there's not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. And Nebuchadnezzar was furious. And he was going to cut them in pieces. They were supposed to be able to tell him the dream and the meaning of the dream. Now Daniel, who's in captivity at this time, hears all about this. And he says to uh, Nebuchadnezzar's servant, my God knows that dream, and my God knows the meaning of that dream. Let me have a prayer time. Give me a little time to talk to my God, and I'll reveal to the king the dream and its meaning. And so finally, Daniel stands before Nebuchadnezzar, and he says, this is what you dreamt. There was this statue. Its head was of gold. Its breast and its arms were of silver. Its belly and its thigh were of bronze. Its legs were of iron. And it had feet and toes that were partly of iron and partly of clay. They were very brittle. And then there was a hand that carved out the, a rock from the side of a mountain. And that rock rolled down the side of a mountain and it hit that image and it crashed and that rock filled the entire earth. Nebuchadnezzar, that was your dream. Now, let me tell you the meaning of that dream. The head of gold, Nebuchadnezzar, that's you. That's Babylon. And the breast and arms of silver, that's the Medes and the Persians, and they're going to conquer you. And the belly and the thigh of bronze, that's Alexander the Great and the Greeks, and they are going to conquer the Medes and the Persians. And the legs of iron, that's Rome. And remember, there are two legs on this statue. And that's very significant, the legs of iron. In the year 395 A.D., Diocletian divided the Roman Empire into the Eastern and Western Roman Empire. There were two legs, two divisions to that empire. And then he talks about the feet and the toes, partly of iron, partly of clay. Now, how many toes would there be on this statue? Ten. That makes sense, doesn't it? Ten toes. He talks about those toes being very brittle. They're going to begin to collapse. And he says, when that begins to happen, there's going to be a stone carved out of the side of a mountain without hands. It's going to roll down and crash the image. And that stone is the kingdom of God. It is the kingdom that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is going to bring to this earth. That, Nebuchadnezzar, is the interpretation of your dream. Now I want to show you something that you might find very interesting. There were ten toes on the statue when the Roman Empire collapsed from within in the year 476 A.D. See, Rome collapsed from within. There was no power that came and conquered Rome like the Persians conquered the Babylonians or the Greeks conquered the Persians or the Romans conquered the Greeks. No. Rome collapsed from within. 
And from out of Rome came ten toes. Here they are, ten nomadic tribes that actually helped bring down the Roman Empire. And these ten nomadic tribes that came out of the Roman Empire eventually formed the continent of Europe. Here they are. You have the Huns, the Ostrogoths, the Visigoths, the Franks, the Vandals, the Suevi, the Burgundians, the Hergali, the Anglo-Saxon, and the Lombards. Ten nomadic tribes that came out of the Roman Empire, that helped bring the Roman Empire down, that formed the, nation, uh, the continent of Europe. I want you to keep this number 10 in mind because we're going to be emphasizing it several times in this lecture tonight. 10, I'm going to say, is going to represent Europe. And I will show you why and you're going to be astounded at what you're going to hear a little later on, if you just hang in there, okay? Now these uh, ten toes, or these ten nomadic tribes, they were actually Germanic people that came from the east and settled in the Roman Empire. Uh, so they eventually formed Germany, the Netherlands, Spain, France, Greece, England, Italy. Those are the Nations that eventually came out of the Roman Empire to form the continent of Europe. So Daniel says, when these nations have formed, and they're going to be brittle, and they're not going to cohere well, when that happens, he says, we're getting very close to the end of time. Because there's going to be a stone that is going to be carved out of the side of a mountain without hands. And it's going to roll down that mountain. It's going to crush that image. And Jesus Christ is going to establish his kingdom here on earth. But I want you to see these ten toes on Nebuchadnezzar's image refer to much more than just the forming of the continent of Europe. There's more to come to that number 10. Hang in there. Okay? Now, let's talk about the scattering of the Jews by the four horns. Now, we want to look now at verse 19. Uh, again, so the angel uh, talked to me, and uh, Zechariah is saying there in verse 19, what are these? And so he said, these are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. So let's talk about these four horns. And what I'm going to say right now is a bit graphic. I'm glad you've had your dinner, because uh, it might be a little hard, some of the things I'm going to talk about. But uh, we're adults, and let's get real, because this is history, and this is what has happened to the Jewish people. Let's talk first of all about the first horn, and that is Babylon. The Babylonian Empire under Nebuchadnezzar invaded Jerusalem three major times. First, in the year 606 B.C. That's when he came and he took the cream of the crop. That's when uh, Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego were hauled off into Babylonian captivity. Then Nebuchadnezzar came back a second time. That was in the year 597 B.C. This is when he took Ezekiel and others like him into captivity. But the major time in which Nebuchadnezzar came into Jerusalem and to Judea was in the year 586 B.C. And that's when he literally destroyed the city, laid it to rubble, and carried the Jews off into Babylonian captivity. And you read about this in 2 Kings chapter 25. Now how did he do this? Here's the story. The thing which Nebuchadnezzar did was surround the city of Jerusalem. No one could get in. No one could get out. And so people, therefore, ran out of food. They ran out of water. And now the people are beginning to starve to death. And so what did parents do? They began to eat their own children. And so cannibalism 
was practiced now by the Jewish people in order to stay alive. Four months into the siege on the city, there was a famine in the land. Now there were some police that fled the city. Somehow they got out. The king at this time of Judea, who reigned in Jerusalem, was King Zedekiah. By night, Zedekiah was able to escape. He's heading toward the city of Jericho, and he gets caught before he gets to Jericho by Nebuchadnezzar's men. And he's hauled off to a place called Riblah. And Riblah was a place 120 miles north of the city of Damascus. Zedekiah's children had already been captured. They were already there at Riblah. And the last thing that King Zedekiah saw was his sons being executed by Nebuchadnezzar. And then they took hot pokers and stuck them in Zedekiah's eyes and blinded him and hauled him off to captivity. After that, the Babylonians burned the temple. They burned the king's palace. They knocked down the wall. They set fire to the entire city. All the priests were rounded up, and they were taken to Riblah as well before Nebuchadnezzar, and all of the priesthood of the Jewish people were executed. Only the poor people were left in the land. And that's how Nebuchadnezzar conquered Judea and the city of Jerusalem and took the Jews into captivity. The second horn is that of the Medo-Persians. Now, they were not nearly as violent as the Babylonians, yet God was angry with them because they did not aid the Israelites during the Babylonian raid. Remember what we talked about last week? We talked about the four horsemen among the myrtle trees. The myrtle trees represented Israel and these four horsemen. What do they do? They go on a surveillance around the earth, and then they come back with a report. And what was the report? Oh, the earth is resting quietly. You see that in verse 11 of chapter 1. Or you get down to verse 15, where the Lord says, I'm exceedingly angry with the nations at ease. The earth was at peace. The nations were at ease. And the Lord is angry when there's peace. Why was he angry? Because there wasn't one single nation that protested the way in which the Jewish people were treated by the Babylonians or the nation of Israel was treated by the Assyrians earlier. God is angry because no one seemed to care. Now, as far as the Persians were concerned, once they uh, conquered the Babylonians, which they did in the year 536 B.C. under Cyrus, they did keep a stranglehold on the Jewish people for 200 years. And perhaps the most famous story that comes out of this is found in the book of Esther, and you know that story very well. How there was, uh, well, there's Queen Esther, and she's married to King Ahasuerus. Of course, uh, Esther was Jewish. And uh, she had an uncle by the name of Mordecai, and Mordecai uncovered a plot by a man by the name of Haman. He wanted to get rid of all the Jews. And when he found out that Mordecai knew something about this, he wanted to have Mordecai hung on the gallows. And so Mordecai gets word to Queen Esther, who in turn uh, bravely tells her husband, the king, because she didn't know how he was going to receive it. It could have cost her her life because she was a Jewess and not a Gentile. Well, as you know, the story had all ended up that Haman was the one that was hung on the gallows. And thus the Jewish people were spared from genocide under the Persians. So the first horn is who? Babylon. The second horn is the Medes and the Persians. The third horn is Greece. Alexander the Great in the year 330 B.C. swept through the then known world and conquered the Persians. Now it was after the death of Alexander the Great in the year 323 B.C. that the empire was divided into four sections, each ruled by one of its generals. 
So this is important. Understand now, he had four major generals. The Grecian Empire has ruled the world. Alexander the Great is dead. So each of his generals get one-fourth of his empire. Now the part that was ruled over, uh, the, this, Israel was ruled by one of the four sections of that empire. And the name of that particular section was Seleucidid, because that was the name of the Greek general. So you had the Seleucidid section. But for the purpose of this study, we're going to call it Syria, because eventually the Seleucidid section became known as Syria. So if you can think, there's the Syrian rule over Israel under the Greeks. Now in the year uh, 195 B.C., a man by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes mounted the throne to rule over the Syrian section of the Grecian Empire. Antiochus Epiphanes wanted to be another Alexander the Great. He wanted to conquer the other three territories. He wanted to be the lone ruler of the world. And so he decides, I'm going to start and attack Egypt, who were known as the Ptolemies. Ptolemy, of course, was one of the generals of Alexander the Great. So the Egyptians were also called Ptolemites. So the headquarters or the capital for the Syrian section of the Grecian uh, portion of the empire was Damascus. And Antiochus Epiphanes leads his army out of Damascus down through Israel. So he's not going to bother the Jews. He already controls them right now. He wants to go to Egypt. He wants to conquer the Ptolemies the Egyptians. He wants to rule that section of the empire. Now, on the island of uh, Crete, or Cyprus rather, the island of Cyprus, the island of Cyprus, there were some Romans. And they knew what Antiochus Epiphanes was doing, and so they got in their ships and came across the Mediterranean, and they stopped Antiochus Epiphanes in his tracks. And Antiochus Epiphanes was not able to conquer the Ptolemies. And so now Antiochus is angry. And he and his men are heading back to Damascus. And they're going right through Israel. They're coming to the city of Jerusalem. And what do you think they do? They commit what is called the abomination of desolation. They first of all offer pigs on the altar of the temple. They put a statue of Zeus Olympus in the holy place of the temple. They forbid any Jewish mother to circumcise her newborn baby. And there were many other atrocities that were committed by Antiochus Epiphanes on the Jews. In fact, Antiochus Epiphanes becomes a type of Antichrist in Scripture. But more than that, alongside of Adolf Hitler... Antiochus Epiphanes is the most hated man in all Jewish history. Well, we come now to uh, the year 165, and the Jewish people decide we need to get revenge, and there was a man by the name of Matthias, and he gets a ragtag band of soldiers together, and he's going to go after Antiochus Epiphanes and free the uh, Judean people, and purify the temple. Well, he dies before he gets that opportunity, and so his son, Judas Maccabeus, takes his place. And he launches a surprise attack against Antiochus Epiphanes. And he's victorious. And so the Jews come back. They purify the temple. Keep in mind what we mean by uh, the... Uh, Abomination of desolation. It is not the destruction of the temple. It is the desecration of the temple. The temple's still standing. But pigs have been offered on the altar. That was, that was taboo. And, of course, uh, idol, uh, Zeus Olympus, is in the holy place of the temple. That's an abomination. So the temple has to be purified. And then the Jews had a celebration. It was a celebration of lights. And you know what that celebration is to this very day. It's Hanukkah. And that's the story of Hanukkah. 
Now notice the fourth horn, that's Rome. Now Israel's independence during this time didn't last too long, 102 years. And so in the year 63 B.C., Pompey of Rome crushed the forces of Judah, and Judah now becomes a Roman province. And that was true, of course, even during the time of Jesus. But Jesus made a prophecy. Remember in Matthew chapter 24, the disciples are there at the temple in Jerusalem, and uh, they're admiring the beauty of the temple. Uh, Zerubbabel's temple, which is what we're talking about here from the book of Zechariah, was not a beautiful temple. But King Herod was going to beautify the temple, expand the temple, make it more magnificent. Probably hadn't been repaired in many, many years. So he's repairing the temple, expanding it, making it more beautiful, and the disciples are saying, my, isn't this a gorgeous building? And what does Jesus say? The day is going to come very soon when not one stone is going to be standing on another stone. And 40 years later, the temple was destroyed under Titus Vespasian. Now, how did that happen? That's a gory story as well. But I'm going to tell it nonetheless because you need to know what happened in 70 A.D. First of all, we have to go back to 66 A.D. And that's when the Romans began to invade the northern part of Israel known as Galilee. Now, why did they do this in the first place? There were uh, Jews known as zealots. In fact, some of the disciples were zealots. Some of Christ's apostles. The zealots hated the Romans. The zealots wanted freedom from Roman oppression. And so they were always annoying Nero. And finally Nero says, I've had enough of this. I'm tired of this. Let's destroy them. And so he calls on his finest general, a man by the name of Titus Vespasian. And Titus Vespasian gets his Roman army together. And they don't go directly and attack the city of Jerusalem. No, they attack from the north. And they start with Galilee at the north and work their way down. It was bloody butchery. And by October of 67 A.D., Galilee was totally subdued. 6,000 Galilean slaves were forced to build the Corinthian Canal in Corinth, Greece. If you've ever been to Corinth, anybody here been to Corinth? Few of you have. You've seen the Corinthian Canal. That was built under Titius Vespasian of Rome by Galilean slaves. Now before, before Vespasian could reach Jerusalem, Nero committed suicide in 67 A.D. So the, the uh, uh, Titus, he says, we got to stop. I need to go back to Rome because he wants to become Nero's replacement. He wants to be the next emperor of Rome. And he is. And so now, as the emperor of Rome, in the year 70 A.D., he leads 80,000 Roman soldiers to the city of Jerusalem at Passover. You know what? Jerusalem is like at Passover. Remember, that's one of the festivals where every male Jew was required, if they lived within a certain distance, to attend the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. There was millions of Jews in the area. And that's when the Roman army comes with 80,000 soldiers. The city is attacked with war machines, like a scorpion, for example, which could hurl rocks and bricks into the crowded city. It all, they also came with what was called a ballastay, which was hurling a hundred pound rocks 600 feet in distance. They used battering rams to knock down the northern wall as well as the temple, and they set the Holy of Holies on fire. Titus 
wanted to crucify 500 Jews. Now he has to get enough wood to make enough crosses. And so he has his soldiers go out and they have to cut down almost an entire forest to get enough wood in order to make enough crosses to crucify all the Jews. The bodies of the dead were thrown over whatever walls were left because they wanted to remove as much stench from the city as possible. The Romans also built a massive dirt wall on the other side of what was the wall in order to keep people contained. Josephus tells us 1,356, 1 million, I'm sorry, 1 million 356,400 Jews were killed at Passover under Titius Vespasian of Rome. Can you imagine that kind of slaughter? Now, there, were, there was a group known as the Essenes. And uh, the Essenes, knowing that the Romans were coming, escaped from the city. And they went, uh, oh, what, uh, 15 miles down the road to Masada. Ever been to Masada? And they went to the top of Masada. I've been there in the heat of the summer. It is hot. Oh, it is hot. But they took with them some um, Old Testament scriptures, which they put in some pottery, and they hid them in the caves just on the uh, east side of the Dead Sea, or west side of the Dead Sea. Now, when the Romans found out that the Essenes were up there, what did the Romans do? They had to climb the hill. You know, you could tram up there today, but now they're climbing up. And the Essenes realized they were coming. And so what did they do? They committed suicide. Every single Jew killed himself because they said, we will not allow a Roman to kill us. And by the time the Roman army got to the top of Masada, all they found were all of these dead Essenes. But what they did for us was so, so important because the greatest archaeological find of our lifetime was back in 1947 when a Muslim boy walking through that cave and throwing stones, you know, like a little kid. He'll pick up a stone and throw it. He threw it right into a cave. Bing! Something broke. And there we have the Dead Sea Scrolls which confirm the veracity of our Old Testament scriptures. Okay, what we see so far in this vision are four horns. There's the Babylonians, there's the uh, Medes and the Persians, there's the Greeks, there's the Romans. They all scattered the Jews and held them in captivity. Now, let's look at verses 20 and 21. I think what we'll do right here, this is a good time to stop, a good time to stop, and uh, we'll take a break, bathroom break, a drink break, whatever you want, and in uh, 15 minutes, we'll come back and finish up the lesson. Okay, we're on page four in our notes. And we're going to look at verses 20 and 21, and it deals with the sending of four craftsmen. So uh, let's look at our text. Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen, and I said, What are these coming to do? So he said, These are the horns of scattered Judah, so that no one could lift up his head. But the craftsmen are coming to terrify them, to cast out the horns of the nations that lifted up their horn against the land of Judah to scatter it. So, we, we see where God now has, there's four horns, got that? Yes. Who are they? Babylon, the Medo-Persians, the Greeks, the Romans. Four horns. Now there's going to be four craftsmen, or four carpenters, or what I'm going to call hammerers. Because what these four hammerers are going to do, they're going to hammer down the four horns. 
because of the way in which they treated the Jewish people. And so you see the craftsman has hammers. Notice next the conquest by the hammerers. We know that Persia hammered Babylon. Greece hammered Persia. Rome hammered Greece. Now when Rome fell, it was not defeated by an empire greater than itself. Remember what we said, it collapsed from within. And remember what happened. Why did it collapse from within? Well, there were ten nations that brought Rome down from within. Ten nations that did not assimilate. And as a result, these ten nations formed the continent of Europe, eventually, and Rome fell. What I want you to see is the number ten is very significant. Because the number ten not only represents the ten nations that brought down the Roman Empire, but the number ten could also represent a revived Roman Empire that is going to come into this world and may well be seen in what is called the European Union. You're going to see how relevant this talk is in just a bit. I mean, we're right up to date. Europe is a godless continent out of which the Antichrist will come and he's described as a beast having seven heads and ten horns. You read about that in Revelation chapter 13 verse 1. There's a beast that comes out of the sea and the sea is described as a sea of people. And this beast has seven heads on it and ten horns. The seven heads are the seven Gentile nations that held Israel captive. That would be Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. That's only six. Which means what? There's another one yet to come. And that, I believe, is the future empire of the Antichrist. Now notice the clarification of the ten horns on the beast. And you see this in Daniel chapter 7. So you might want to get your Bibles out to Daniel chapter 7. It says uh, in Daniel chapter 7, again, Daniel has, uh, if you go to verse, uh, verse 1, Daniel had a dream, he had visions, and then he sees the very same thing that, he, uh, that Nebuchadnezzar had, just describing it a different way. He sees these beasts, four beasts, coming out of the sea. One would be Babylon, one would be the Medo-Persians, one would be Greece, and the fourth one is going to be Rome. And what we're concerned about now is Rome. So notice verse 7. And I saw in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, the fourth beast to come up out of the sea, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and tampering the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. Notice, it had how many horns? Ten. Ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. So what have we seen here? Daniel notices in his own uh, vision here, Another horn. Here's, here's, this, here's this beast that's come out of the sea. It has, what? Seven horns. Or ten horns, rather. Ten horns. And then he sees, what? A little horn coming up amidst these other horns. And three of the horns are plucked out by its roots. Now, what could the, uh, uh, these horns refer to? Well, we know that the horns refer to kings. So there are ten kings. Who are these Kings. Well, there's a couple of viewpoints in regards to this. There are those who would say these ten kings would be administrators that are going to rule over the world as assistants under the Antichrist during the time of the Great Tribulation when there's a one world government. I don't know whether that's true or not. Another viewpoint is, remember, there are ten uh, nations that formed Europe. I want you to see that ten could well represent Europe, and these ten kings could well represent those who are ruling over Europe. And coming out of Europe 
is a little horn, and there are three of the kings who are uprooted at this time. And so he's going to be given power. If you get over to verse 25 of Daniel chapter 7, he's going to be given power for three and a half years. So, the tribulation is how long? You, 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 some of you know that. You've studied this. Seven years. Seven years. It's divided into two, what? Three and a half year periods of time. How does the tribulation begin? Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. The Antichrist is going to come. He's going to establish a covenant what, between Israel and and the Jewish uh, and the Arab people for the purpose of rebuilding a temple in Jerusalem on Temple Mount. And the book of Revelation says it is going to be next to that which is owned by the Gentiles. What would that be? The Dome of the Rock. The Muslim shrine is on Temple Mount. Perhaps right behind it, the Jews are going to build a temple. And this is going to be negotiated by the Antichrist to bring about peace. How is this ever going to happen? Well, i got a whole lesson on that, and I don't want to get into that. I would take another hour. But that's how the tribulation begins. So the Antichrist has influence at the very beginning of the tribulation. I think he's perhaps demon-possessed. It's going to take three and a half years to build the temple. And once the temple is completed, what does the Antichrist do? The Apostle Paul tells you in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he's going to enter the temple. He's going to proclaim himself to be God. I am God. I believe then he's going to become demonically possessed or satanically possessed. He's already demonically possessed. Now he's going to be satanically possessed. And what is he going to do for the next three and a half years? He's going to try to annihilate the Jewish people. He wants to wipe them off the face of the earth. So, you have the Antichrist coming out of the nations. I believe he comes out of Europe. And he disrupts three of the kings. Now let's get back to Nebuchadnezzar's dream again. Remember what Nebuchadnezzar dreamt? He had this image head of gold and the breast and, and the arms of silver and the, and the belly and thighs of uh, bronze and the legs of iron and what were the feet with the ten toes? Yeah, they were, they, they were made of clay and, and iron and it did not cohere. And we said that could well be the ten nations that came out of the Roman Empire. But they also have another meaning to it. And that's the composition of the European Union. On January the 1st, 1958, the European Common Market with six nations was formed. And notice the charter. The charter initially called for how many nations? Ten nations. Today, uh, with, uh, with Brexit, with, with Great Britain getting out, there's now, and so these notes were written before Brexit, got that? There's now 27 countries. And, and you see, the European Common Market has its capital in Brussels. Why is it that Great Britain got out? You know? There's a couple of reasons. First of all, the British people wanted their sovereignty back. They were tired of being told what to do from Brussels. But secondly, they had an immigration problem. The Muslims were taking over. I was, uh, I was in Copenhagen, I believe it was, on a, on a cruise. And I sat next to a, a man from uh, Birmingham, England. And he said to, to me, you people in America had better wake up because what's happening in Great Britain is terrible. The Muslims are taking over. They're forming no-go zones throughout the city of London. You realize in the city of Paris, there are 78 no-go zones. And they're developing Sharia law within those zones. So they are overriding the law of the country. 
and even police officers and firemen are afraid to go into those zones. And if you would accidentally, as a tourist, travel into one of those zones, you do so at the risk of your own life. And he was saying to me, we had better wake up here in America because the Muslims are coming. And the very reason you have Brexit is because the British people said, we want our sovereignty back. We want our borders protected. We are tired of what is happening with Muslims immigrating into this country. I'll tell you the next country that might fall is Italy. You just wait in the next few weeks. Italy is in very severe financial problems and the stock market may well collapse very soon again. Might be temporary. But, but just look, just look at, at, at the European market today. Well, well, how is it described by, by in Nebuchadnezzar's Greek? The toes are made of what? Clay and iron. It's brittle. It does not hold together. It does not cohere. And even when the little horn, the Antichrist, comes up, three of the kings are uprooted. You're going to see a collapse in the European Union. I was listening to... Uh, Daniel Youssef, who's a pastor from Cairo, I heard him speak just a couple of weeks ago on radio. He says, by 2025, some of the nations of Europe that are a part of the European common market will be overrun by Muslims. They will have Sharia law, and this is going to begin the collapse of the European common market. Scripture is and how up to date this talk is when we can talk about Brexit and when we can talk about nations that are ready to collapse in Europe. Well, let's uh, just another thought that comes to my mind here. There are three nations that were really that supported 49% of the European market. You know what they were? The number one support is uh, Germany. The number two is France. The number three is Great Britain. Now Great Britain is out. That's going to put much more financial load on Germany. I was in Greece here a while back. I talked with uh, my guide. And the guide was saying if it wasn't for Germany, we as a nation wouldn't even exist today. And we've had to stay in the European Union only to keep from going bankrupt. You see, there's some very fragile nations, Greece and Spain and Portugal and Ireland and Italy are all in trouble. The toes and the image are beginning to crumble. They're brittle. Let's look at the surety of uh, Israel's preservation. That's verses 19 through 21, but this will, will quit. Getting back to Zechariah. It's just saying here, what are these coming to do? What are these craftsmen coming to do? These hammerers coming to do? These are the horns of scattered Judah so that no one could lift up his head, but the craftsmen are coming to terrify them to cast out the horns of the nation that lifted up their horn against the land of Judah. The sky. What we're saying is, God is going to protect the nation of Israel. Those who bless Israel, God is going to bless, and those who curse Israel, God is going to curse. Have we not seen that in the four horns and the four hammers who came and pounded down the four horns? happening in Europe today. Well, are there more horns? That's the question. There's only four horns here in Zechariah's prophecy. Could there be more horns? Remember, I had to look at Zechariah 1 verse 19. It says this, 
These are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Remember what I said about that word scattered? It's in perfect tense. It's completed action of the past, completed action of the present, completed action of the future. The implication by the use of the perfect tense is that there are future horns other than what Zachariah is talking about here. But what could they be? Well, let's clarify that. How about uh, 15th century Spain? Could that be a horn? Spain was the greatest power in the world in 1492 when Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And remember who was ruling at that time? That was King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. They were Catholics. And there were Muslims living in Spain and there were Jews living in Spain and they drove the Muslims out and they wanted to drive the Jews out. And you had to become a Catholic or you could not live in Spain. And they gave the Jews, Queen Isabella gave the Jews 24 hours to get out of the country. They had to leave everything behind and get out of the country. And now these Jews are wondering, where are we going to go? What country is going to receive us? And so many of them left with nothing but the clothes on their back. Tens of thousands died trying to reach safely. Many were killed with a rumor that started. And that rumor was that many of these Jews had swallowed gold and silver and precious jewelry. And so the Spaniards then, under the orders of Queen Isabella, killed these Jews and cut open their stomachs to try to get the jewelry that was not there. But all the money that the Jews left behind helped finance Christopher Columbus and his trip across the Atlantic Ocean to discover America. That money came from the Spanish Inquisition and the driving of the Jews out of Spain. Well, by the 17th century, Spain was facing political and economic problems. They suffered military defeats at the hands of France and Portugal and Holland. The world power now was shifting from Spain, which had been the greatest power in the world at that time, and now it's France. And today, Spain is a relatively weak nation militarily. It has very little respect amongst the world's superpowers. Could France have been the hammer that brought Spain down? Just a thought. Consider Nazi Germany as the horn. Adolf Hitler launched the Holocaust, gassing some six million Jews. The Hammers were the Allied forces which defeated the Nazis to end World War II. Consider Great Britain as a horn. In the 19th century, Great Britain was friendly to Israel. It was a Christian nation. They were sending missionaries out all over the world. Remember John and Charles and Wesley? And, and, and some of the hymns that we used to sing in church, and the Christmas carols, they were written by Charles Wesley. Don't sing those anymore. Anyway, they were a Christian nation. And so what happened? Well, with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire following World War I, see the, the, the Turks, the Ottoman Empire, controlled Palestine. That would be uh, Israel. And in the Middle East, we include Jordan and the nation of Jordan, if you know where that is, kind of out here, and then Israel. That, the whole Middle East, that was under the control of the Ottoman Empire. But in World War I, the Ottoman Empire was on the wrong side of the war. They sided with the Germans and lost. And so now there's what's known as the Sykes-Peacock Agreement in Paris, where Great Britain and France are going to divide up the whole Middle East. And England got Palestine. And so in the year 1916, uh, they, uh, or it was 1917 rather, uh, they, they developed what was called the Balfour Declaration. And the Balfour Declaration was going to give all of Palestine to the nation of Israel. So they once again could, be, could become a nation. But the Arabs protested. 
And the Arab said, no, that's not fair. You can't give all of that land to the Jews. We'll shut off your oil if you do. And so in 1922, the nation of Jordan was formed, and that is two-thirds of Palestine. The nation of Jordan. And that was all on the west, uh, east side of the Jordan River. Here you have the Jordan River down here. So you have the, the west side, you have the east side, that becomes Jordan. That was the majority of the land. Now you have just a little sliver of land that is west of the Jordan River. And that now was divided amongst the Jews and the Arabs who lived in the land. So part of it was Israel, part of it was the Arab territory, Israel. I mean, really it's squirrely. And there was a, a lot of conflict between the Jews and the Arabs. They couldn't get along at all. And finally, uh, Winston Churchill says, well, I'm finished with this. I don't want any more dealings with the Middle East. I want out. Turned it over to the United Nations. That's another story. But the thing I want you to see is that in 1922, the nation of Jordan was formed and the rest of the land just west of the Jordan River was given to the Jews and the Arabs. Well, uh, then the Holocaust breaks out. And there were Jews who were living in Europe that wanted to go to Israel or their part of Palestine for, for safety from the war, World War II. And it was Great Britain who prevented them from going. And what happened to those Jews who wanted to get out of Europe? They ended up in concentration camps and were gassed to death. Well, at the end of World War II, the Arabs sighted with the, the Great Britain and the of the Arabs over oil. Now, what happened? Right after World War II ended. Remember, Great Britain had the biggest empire the world has ever known. They had colonies in Asia, in South America, in Africa. They were spread all over. But right after World War II ended, so did the British Empire. It collapsed. Could God have been the hammer yes. that brought the British Empire down for the way in which they treated the Jewish people? One more possible horn and I quit. Could the United States of America be a horn? The Obama administration has held Israel in contempt from the moment he took office. He has embarrassed Prime Minister Netanyahu by leaving him in an office in the White House and walking off to lunch and leaving him by himself. He has sought a favor of Muslims and marginalized Israel and its leaders. He's made an agreement with Iran and gave them 150 billion of our tax dollars to lay aside their nuclear program for 10 years while the Iranians shout death to America and death to Israel. And yet they have violated this agreement by shooting off long-range ballistic missiles capable of striking Tel Aviv right now. I got time to tell you this, I think, because yeah, I, I'm going to give a lesson on uh, in, in my church on the life of Muhammad, and you get this from the Surah, which is one of the three holy books, and it's called the Treaty of, of Hudaybiyah. Muhammad came from from Medina, and he wanted to come to Mecca with the idea of capturing the city of Mecca and turning it over to Allah because they worship 360 gods at the Kaaba in Mecca. And now only one god, that is Allah. Well, he was met by an army from, from uh, Mecca and he realized he couldn't defeat the army. So what did he do? He 
He says, well, we're going to form a treaty here. And the treaty is this. Anybody from my army that wants to join you people, go ahead. You can join. No problems whatsoever. But we're not going to have anybody from your side come and join us. Now that sounds like a, a really good deal for the, for the people of, of Mecca. Because Muhammad was willing to give up his army, realizing he didn't have enough soldiers anyway. So what does he do? He goes out to an area in the Arab desert where a bunch of Koahite Jews resided. And he began to uh, prostitute with their women and turn them into slaves and ultimately did this. He said, if you'll join me, the men, I will, I will guarantee you uh, I will guarantee you booty. I will guarantee you all the women you want. Just come and join me. Now this, this treaty, by the way, I, I did say, was for 10 years. The treaty of Hudabiah was for 10 years. How long is this agreement that Obama has made with Iran? 10 years. What did Muhammad do? It wasn't 10 years. It was only a couple of years. He got an army big enough from those Jews who were willing to join him and rather than have their heads cut off because he cut off 800 heads of Jewish people in the Arab desert. Don't tell me Israel is a, uh, Islam is a religion of peace. That's a bunch of malarkey. Just read the Quran. I have. There are 109 war verses in the Quran. There are 35 verses calling for your neck. So, now he has a big enough army. What does he do with that army? He comes into Mecca and he conquers Mecca. He did not honor the 10-year agreement. That was the Treaty of Hudabiah. And that is the very thing that Khomeini said when this agreement was made with Iran this is going to be like the Treaty of Udabaya. We're not going to abide by it. <laughs> we have to wake up, folks. The Muslims are coming. I know there are peaceful Muslims. I know there are Muslims that fight for our country. We have a president who's against the nation of Israel. You realize that the Democratic Convention, what flag did they have flying? They raised a Palestinian flag. You couldn't find an American flag, hardly.